A link to my Discord will be in the description where I'll try my best to answer your questions. In today's tutorial, I'll explain how you can create Simon Says within Counter-Strike. It uses Freescript and today you'll be doing some OOP work with it. I will not explain how it works in Hammer, but I'll go over the logic of the code. So this is a theory side video and I will not explain the practical side. The map is available to download in the description below. Welcome to the introduction to scroll programming. Today we're going to be doing Simon Says minigame and it will be designed in OOP. As you've seen from the video beforehand, Simon Says is a memory game. You have to repeat the sequence that is randomly generated. You'll do this until you hit the wrong colour. For every correct answer you get, the game will add one more generated sequence onto it. It will keep doing this until you hit the wrong colour. Then it resets back and starts from the first sequence and it builds onwards. The user will repeat the sequence by hitting the lights with a pistol. This isn't the best method of doing this, but this allows the user to input a sequence back so the game can validate if it's correct or not. Within our Harmer map, we need four prop dynamic glows. We need two ambient generics for sound, a point sever command for entering commands, one logic auto so we can set defaults when the map's loaded. We need a logic event listener to listen out for events in the game. We also need a logic script. This will hold our reference to scripts. We need a logic branch for logic to check what state it is and we need a game text which will display a text to the screen. I made a program specifically for a logic event listener offence. It has all the events that you can use in Counter-Strike, so I will search for player C. It will give me the attributes and its comments if it's supplied. I can also copy the generated code from the bottom as you can see. I can copy it to my clipboard and then I can paste it in a text editor. You don't need to memorize these, this is all for you. Link is in the Discord. The advantage of using a logic script is that it has something called an entity group and it has an array of max size 16 and its index max is 15 because remember with an arrays we do n minus 1. This means we can target entities without searching for them which is a huge bonus. So we can reference 15 entities per one script. Within this project I use quite a lot of global strings. We can do this by adding two columns in front. As you see here, I have two different global strings variables within my project. This is referenced within the string. This will cause an issue if you don't reference this in the script that you're referencing. So it's important to check that a global string variable is declared before calling it within hammer. This comes handy as you don't need to memorize the variable and it can be directly accessed from hammer. Here are what the prop dynamic glows look like within Hammer. Each one has an event on where if one takes damage, it will reference the light logic entity, it will execute the run script code, and then it will call the function heart logic with a parameter that is a global string with the color that is associated with. With Hammer, we can listen to certain events that got fired within the game engine. We are able to do this by targeting certain events. Here you see highlighted in red is player C. So we are listening out when a user enters text within the game. Notice also that fetch event data is also turned on. This means that we want information to be returned back. Player chat brings back two attributes, which are the user ID, which we don't much care about but the attribute that we do care about is text. So then we call on event fired, we reference the event itself, which is chat underscore event. We run the run script code, and then we call the global function display with the event underscore data, which has the information called from the event. While I was developing this mini game, I had an issue. I was still able to hit the lights after it's playing, despite declaring a boolean within the script. This became really annoying. The solution to this problem was to use a logic branch. When the logic branch is true, this means that the sequence is currently playing. If it's false, 
that means it's not plain, which will allow us to shoot back the sequence and let the program validate if it was the right sequence that was played back. Here is all the outputs within our logic branch. We are targeting the two outputs on true and on false. With this, we can make our game adapt to its behaviour depending on the state that the logic branch is set to. Now we somehow need to link the two free scripts up. But how do we do that? We can do this in three different steps. We can link up the scripts. This is using the include script within your free script. We can create a fake namespace. We basically create a table. And that's why it's called a fake namespace. And we assign a new key to that namespace. This means now that we can access and link up and use methods from other free scripts without the need to rewrite them all over again in the other scripts, which is really handy and it's really good modularity. We first have to know what a table is. A table is an associative container, which contains a key and a value. For this example, we have a table called cool table, which has a key name with value James, a key called print name, which references a function that states the name. And when we call cool table, dot print name. Notice as it prints out the name. The cool thing about Squirrel is that it allows you to assign functions, which is really handy. Squirrel allows us to expand our tables. Notice as now I can create another function within the table called expanded function without actually declaring within the initial initialization of the cool table. But notice now as we have to use the new slot operator we cannot do this on local tables. You may ask yourself, why do we need this fake namespace? In OOP, we have a namespace. It gives variables and methods a scope within it. It's also used to separate class logics to prevent calling other methods by accident. Which method will be displayed back to the user? Let's now find out what gets called back. The answer is the last function. Even though we have three different ways of displaying do something, only the last one is displayed. What if we want to use each of these, but we can't? The solution is to use tables to create fake namespaces. We first have to create a global table. This would be our root namespace. We call this ns, but it's up to you to decide what you want to call it. Then we have to expand on the namespace. So we are going to create tables to be added onto a table. You can do this line by line, or if you want to do it more differently, you can list it with n. Both ways are acceptable and does not change functionality at all. Now, we can expand on the namespaces. We can add do something to the working table, which is associated with the ns. So, in English terms, we work from the right to the left. Do something belongs to working, while working belongs to ns. But ns doesn't belong to anything, as it's the root table. But now, how do we invoke the methods? How can we use them? Since we aren't expanding our namespace attributes, we cannot use the double columns. We can access each attribute by using the dot symbol. And as you see from the output, each do something prints out something else. Now we face a different issue. Although that this is global, it's only global to the free script itself. We cannot use this out with our class. So for us to use this in our classes, we have to change a local table to a global scope table. We do this by using a double columns. Now we can link and communicate between different free scripts. Here is an example from the free script. We have a global table called game, which is uninitialized at runtime. Then we create a new attribute called sound object, which will now be referenced under entity group four. So that is the fifth element within the, the free script, within the logic script. Then we have two other attributes called Simon class and script reference, which is assigned null for now. So that is us for the theory within the code. You can download the map example and all the free scripts within Gaming Banana.
Thank you for getting this far in the video. I haven't fully went under how the OOP structure works within the program, but I gave you the ideas and how things work to get things working for my map. Remember that you can download this in Game of Banana and you can play it with the map itself with all the references included into the file, or you can just simply drag in the other file which contains each item separately. All you have to do is drag it into the CSGO folder where it's installed and then you can access it within Hammer and Counter Strike. If you have any questions or still confused, I'm happy to help. Join the channel in the description below.